nervous system. We're going to look at the structures and some of the generalized functions, or the CNS for short. And essentially, what it is is the brain and the spinal cord. So let's draw some pictures of the brain and the spinal cord and get a feel for what's going on in there. Okay? We're going to draw a couple of pictures of the brain. All right, so just take a general outline color. Black will do. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw, take about a half a page, make lots of room. We're going to draw sort of, um, this will be the, the front, right? And this will be, the, that's your forehead, and this is the back of your head over here, just so we have some perspective. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw this sort of thing like this, a little, little goopy all around, and hook it sort of like that, and then just kind of go up like this, and stop about there. That's easy to do. Well, about a half a page, I would think. Okay. I'm going to hope this thing doesn't keep making all this noise for some reason. It's Okay. So far, so good. All right. Now, I'm going to take a different color. Um, and I'll use blue, I guess. doesn't matter what color. And right sort of here, I'm going to draw just sort of a roundy kind of thing. It goes like... All right. Uh, then, we're going to sort of bring this down around like this. And just do like a little hook like that. And just kind of go to there for now. Okay. And then we're just going to swing it around like that and just kind of go that far. And then we can, maybe, ah, you know what, we'll connect it like this. We'll come down there like that. We'll stop it like that. And we'll get a nice little blue crayon and we'll color it all sort of in. Oops, blue, blue, blue. Not black. There. This is called the corpus callosum. So you see that over in your head as you draw it. Corpus callosum, corpus callosum. And there's a very interesting story about a man named Phineas Gage, who was a railway worker who actually had a, an iron rod that they used to tamp down the gunpowder in the holes they would drill. And this iron rod sparked the gunpowder and was driven through his head. And it went right through the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is basically um, uh, a very, very large connection of nerve fibers that connects the right and left hemispheres of the brain together and allows them to communicate with each other. He severed his in half completely, pretty much. What was weird is that he survived without any real major complications until... A little while later, he suddenly lost all of his ability to control his emotional state because one side of the brain is kind of controlling the other. And uh, he just basically went crazy, the poor guy. And uh, Phineas Gage is a very common psycho psychology 101. If you learn, about, you learn about the brain and you'll study Phineas Gage, I'm sure. Uh, you could look him up. It's kind of an interesting story. So the corpus callosum, which is e effectively the connector now, we're drawing the brain as a slice through the middle, okay? This is a cross-section sliced through it, so that's why we can see it. Normally, if you were looking at a brain, you wouldn't see the corpus callosum because it's, it's inside, connecting the two hemispheres. Okay, uh, next we have, uh, let's see. I guess the next thing we'll draw is the stem of the brain. I'll get another color. I'll take red for this. And I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to draw. I'm going to draw two structures. Um, put that there. So that can go there. All right. So right here, I'm going to draw this little circular shape like that, right about there. And then for the rest of it, I'm just going to kind of go up like this, and around like that, and down we go, like that. And we'll color that in in a nice red color with our red crayon. Ah, 
I swear I pressed red. Okay. That's actually two structures, but they're very closely related, so I drew them the same color. Let's go back to our pen. And then I'll use this nice green. And we need another sort of thing, sort of sandwiched under here, kind of goopy like this. And it just kind of goes up and fills in this whole gap here. I'll shade that in green. That is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is a part of the brain near the back that handles all of your motor coordination and balance and things like that. It, it's controlling motor skills, cerebellum. Okay. And it kind of has a, a sort of a, I'm going to draw like a veiny, it has like a leafy texture to it when you look at it, something like that. Okay. Um, I'm also going to draw in here, uh, let's see, this little gland, which I'll pick purple for. I'm going to draw it sort of right here in the center of the brain in cross section. This is the thalamus. Remember the thalamus, which was one of the, the endocrine glands that secretes hormones? And uh, the other thing we need is the pituitary gland. So I'll put it also in purple because they're both sort of glands. And the pituitary sort of sits down here, kind of hangs off like that. Um, and then this just kind of does that. Okay. Then what I'll do is I'll just add some detail here with the black. Just kind of make this look all twisty and goobly. The, uh, the brain is folded. The tissues are all folded in, in this cerebral cortex, this is called. So that's a pretty good start. Okay. And then what I'll do is I'll just shade that all in sort of in a gray color. Uh, let me pick a lighter gray, though, that doesn't screw up the picture too much. Okay. Fantastic. So let's label. Well, actually, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're not quite done yet, are you? So we'll wait a second for you, and then we'll label. Okay. So the biggest chunk of the brain. Now this is the human brain. What you have to understand is that uh, a lot of these structures have evolved to be quite larger in the human brain than they are in more primitive brains, or by primitive, I should say, um, more less evolved brains, I guess. So if we look at the brain of a, of a frog, it'll look slightly different. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later if we have time. Okay, so for some labels, we'll just use black. So here we have the cerebrum. Sometimes it's labeled the cerebral cortex. It means the same thing. Uh, your book calls it the cerebrum, so that's what we'll call it. I'm sorry, what? The, it's the whole thing. The black lines are just to show the folds and twists. This this tissue of the brain is is so large that it, it, it can't all fit, or it would, be, it would require a large skull to hold it. So to help keep it uh, sort of large but also compact, it tends to all be folded and twisted on itself. It's like crumpled up, kind of. So that's what all those little lines are supposed to be. So there's the cerebrum. Down below we have the cerebellum, which is, these are, in the human brain, these are the two largest chunks. If you were to see a brain, that's basically what you would see on the outside for the most part. Because remember, this is a cut through the middle, so you wouldn't see a lot of these middle structures. And then, of course, sticking out of the bottom, we have the brain stem, as it's called. So... The entire red part is called the brainstem. Okay? I don't know how many labels I can get on here without it starting to look really crazy. Um, so, right at the, this becomes the spinal cord. So, right at the bottom, I'm going to put spinal cord. The brainstem goes down and attaches to the spinal cord at the bottom. There's a section sort of um, right below the pons. I'm going to put a little sort of dotted area here. Right? 
This is the, actually, you know what, forget the dotted area. That just makes it look crazy. Let me erase those. This part right under here, let's just put an arrow, is called, all right, so we have the medulla oblongata. Oblongata just means stretched out, oblong, right, elongated. So that's the medulla oblongata. And then we have this little guy that I drew that's round. He's called the pons. The pons. Okay? And then right up at the top, right up here, this is called the midbrain. So there's the hindbrain, there's the midbrain. Um, these are all just sort of general geographical kind of terms that show where things are located. But then, yeah, right where I'm pointing there? Yeah. Now all of that, if you, if you want to call it somehow, if you want to just kind of do one of these and put brainstem, the entire red structure is considered to be the brainstem. Okay, I'm going to change colors to help identify some of these other ones because they're very small. So, right in here, a little blobby gland. That's the pituitary gland. Pituitary gland. I guess we should put gland on there. And then the other gland that's in there is the thalamus. So, right here, thalamus. Oops. S. Good. The thalamus. Oh, only one L in thalamus. My mistake. Sorry. Let's fix that. Thal. Oh, I did it again. Thalamus. All right. We didn't label the corpus callosum. I'll go back to black for that which is, the, actually, I'll use blue. It's the only blue structure on the whole thing, so let's label it in blue. Uh, let me put an arrow here. Corpus callosum. That's just a Latin word. Corpus means body or lump of stuff. They call it a body. And um, if you've ever heard of a callus, a callus on your skin is a thick, hard spot from being rubbed all the time, right? Well, callosum refers to the, the texture of this corpus callosum. It's basically many, many nerves, almost like, like a very ropey, fibrous connector, because right? it's got so many connections going through the two sides of the brain. So it's basically just this fibrous connector body. That's what that kind of Latin means. And then there's one more thing we should put on here. Um, it refers to a region sort of right up here on the brain. I'm just going to shade in. I'm going to use another color. Maybe I'll just use this um, yellowy color or this brownie orange color is better. And I'll get a crayon. Better make sure I got the right color because it doesn't always work. And I'm going to shade in this region. Like that. Uh, it, it's hard to actually delineate this structurally but it's there, and it's this region, and it's called the hypothalamus, and you'll remember that also. I'm going to put it in purple because purple was our glands. So I'll do, where am I going to draw this? Right here. And point to this region sort of just below the thalamus. Hypo means under or less than or below. So hypothalamus. So now we have a lot of the sort of parts of the brain that we need. Um, some of you on, your, on, on one of your tests or assignments I was reading, I forget which one it was, you're confusing the hippocampus with the hypothalamus. So there was the hypocampus and the hypothalamus showing up. The, the, the hippocampus is another brain structure that um, is sort of in this middle central region, but we're not going to worry about that one. Uh, the hypothalamus is the gland, though. Hypothalamus and thalamus. So don't don't uh, mix those up. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, it's an, it's other structure. Like I said, we're not going to label every possible thing because it'll just get crazy. So there are other things in there. The hippocampus actually is, was named because of its shape. It kind of looks like a um, like a little. I think it's a horse or something. Or a, yeah, the, the prefix hippo means horse. The uh, hippopotamus is Greek for water horse or river river horse. Potamus means river. So the hippocampus is another structure, but I, this is all we're going to worry about because we studied glands, so we've got those delineated, and that's good enough for us. So this is a structural picture of the brain. It describes the different pieces and parts, okay? and we'll learn a little bit about what they do later. Now we're going to do more of a functional picture of the brain. What we've discovered is that if we take this cerebral cortex, the black part of the brain, we can divide that up in terms of some of the jobs that it seems to do. Okay? Can I go ahead? Yeah. All right, so now we're going to go down here and we're going to look at the cerebral cortex in a little bit more detail in a functional type picture. Okay? So I'll draw in black the cerebral cortex. This is no longer a cross section. We're looking at the entire side of the brain now. So um, I'm going to draw the cortex like this around the back and then just kind of across like this. The rest of the brain, the rest of the brain we're not going to worry about. The cerebellum would be tucked in, well like, maybe I'll put it in green and we'll just say that the green parts aren't really what we're after here. Um, this, actually, let me erase that a bit. I went too far on this. So let's fix that. Let this kind of go like that. The cerebellum is sort of tucked in at the back here like this. And then the brain stem kind of here, the pawns and various things. But we're not worried about the green so much. We're just worried about the black. Okay, so I'll just put some nice little delinear, show the convoluted, twisty cort cortex of the cerebrum like this. Okay, very good. There it is. So what, we, what we've discovered, and we've discovered this remarkably by opening people's skulls and putting electrodes into their brains and stimulating parts of the skull and seeing what happens. One of the most famous experiments was done by a person. Uh, incidentally, your brain feels no pain. So if you, cut, if you, if you put a, a, an injection of lidocaine on your skin to numb it, you can cut the skin of the scalp. You can cut through the bone of the, of the uh, skull, and you can lift it off like a cap and expose the entire brain. And you can poke around in there, and the person does not feel any pain, but they do feel weird sensations. If you touch an electrode, which an electrode has an electrical signal, which means it's able to disrupt the voltage of a membrane, which means it's able to start an action potential. Right? And if you poke that in somebody's brain in a certain spot, you can make their arm shoot up. Or you can, make them, you can make them suddenly lose the ability to speak. Or you could, uh, as this person did, they were poking around in the brain, and the person said the, the famous statement, I smell burnt toast. And what they had done is they had somehow triggered uh, a memory of the smell of burnt toast. And this person was convinced they were smelling burnt toast because of that stimulation. So we really have learned a lot about that. Okay, so... Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to draw a back section. Let me use uh, let me use blue. At the back of the brain, there is sort of a little sort of section, like this. Now these are not physical sections; you can't see them, but we know that this area that I'll just kind of color in with a blue crayon is somehow uh, related to a particular function. So we'll shade this in in blue, and this is called the occipital lobe. So I'll write that in blue beside it. The occipital lobe. The occipital lobe uh, has a huge dedicated area for vision and processing of vision. Uh, if you get a blow to the back of the head, you can sometimes black out and lose your vision temporarily, right, for a few seconds. So that's the, the occipital lobe. Uh, and we'll talk about, we'll, we'll, do, we'll talk about the in individual functions of each a bit later. Okay, then we need to do a sort of a lobe in this region. So I'll use a red color, uh, and it's going to be sort of 
this region down here. And I'll shade that in with red crayon. And then I'll label it with red. This is called the temporal lobe. Uh, well, you know where your temple is, right? It's kind of on the side of your head. It's this area in the brain right on the side above your ear, temporal lobe. Then we have the sort of front section, which I'll do in a nice yellow color, this front section of the brain. And we'll color that in in yellow. This is called the frontal lobe because it's near the front. So if I write that, hopefully if I write that in yellow, you'll be able to see it. Problem is yellow doesn't always come up too well, but I'll try it here. Oh yeah, it works. Frontal lobe, right there. The frontal lobe is very much uh, where we feel like the seat of our consciousness is and our thinking and processing of things. The frontal lobe was often uh, what they used to do back in the day when, of course, they really didn't understand brains. Uh, uh, they would take people who had extreme, extreme um, undesirable behaviors and lock them in mental, mental institutions. And, and in order to control them, and keep them from doing violent things and being, you know, uh, what they would do is they would take uh, a sharp blade and insert it through the nose up into the frontal lobe. And then they would switch it around and basically scramble up the frontal lobe. This was called a lobotomy, a frontal lobotomy. And what they found is when they finished, the person no longer had any violent tendencies. Of course, they also were pretty much a vegetable in terms of their thought. They didn't think. They lay, sat in a chair all day. It was kind of a, a very uh, extreme and obviously not ethical treatment. It did cure the problem, but it also created you know, um, a quality of life that was virtually nothing. So luckily, we don't do this anymore, but it was done. If you've heard of a lobotomy, that's what it was, a scrambling of the frontal lobe. All right, now in this purple color, the rest of the part of the brain all up here, and we'll shade that in in purple, right on, purple. This is called the parietal lobe. So back to my pen, purple pen, uh, parietal lobe. Okay, so these are all sections of the cortex, the cerebral cortex, divided up, not physically, you can't see these sections by looking, but they're divided up in terms of what we've discovered about sort of function. Okay, and let's just maybe make a little little list of some of the, some of the functions that are found. Um, the picture in your textbook doesn't have, doesn't have, um, some of the other key things. Let me see if there's something in this other one that has. Yeah, this is this is one that has an interesting thing. Um, if we look at the temporal lobe, you don't have to do this on your picture because we're going to make a chart later that shows these things. But if I just take uh, my black here, I can go through here and show you a few things. So in the uh, temporal lobe, for instance, uh, there's an area right here which is sort of where we find smell. It has a lot to do with smell, the way we process smells. There's an er area sort of right here that has a lot to do with how we process hearing, which makes sense because that's about where our ears are, right? Um, and then there's another sort of... Um, other, another sort of area near the top. Uh, this is... One is, one is processing hearing and one is more physical functioning of hearing. Those are both sort of related to hearing. So the temporal lobe is obviously big on hearing and smell, right? Um, back here, there's a whole area of this part that has to do with vision. Okay, so we're not, I'm not going to label all these. We're going to write them in a chart later. But that's where you would find the vision area in the occipital lobe. Um, speech. 
being able to talk is sort of somewhere right about here in the parietal lobe. Actually, no, sorry, my mistake. It's in the frontal lobe, speech, right there. In the parietal lobe, there's another section of speech. There's also a section of taste. This circle I drew here is about taste. Speech is found sort of about there. Uh, there's a section in the parietal lobe near the back for reading. We find this area is dedicated to being able to read. Uh, there's a whole section along the top for somatosensory. That's the body senses that you were asking me about earlier. Sensations all up along the top here. Uh, there's something right here which is to do with motor skills. It's called the motor cortex. Um, actually, sorry, that's in the frontal lobe. Uh, yeah, more, more here, sorry. Again, just, just to give you an idea of how all the different parts of our conscious control and thoughts, and some subconscious, are all basically controlled by different parts of this brain. So if you, if you stimulate these parts of the brain, you can make things happen. If you stimulate the motor cortex, you can make an arm move, right, by using electrodes. And we've been able to ident identify all these parts. So let's just make a list of all those black circles. That would be easier than you trying to draw them all onto a picture. Um, some of the things that happen in each lobe. So we'll start with the, um, the, the frontal lobe. So basically in the frontal lobe, there's, there's some speech sections. There's the motor cortex at the back of it for speech, motor cortex. And uh, the association area. The front part, of that, that's really what it's all about, most of it. Association, which basically means putting all this stuff together, our ability to think and process and link and, and, and associate all the things that are happening. Um, our, our, our thinking and thought processes are, are very much tied to the frontal lobe. In the parietal lobe, we have things like uh, reading, Taste and speech again. You'll notice that speech shows up in several because the, the ability to speak requires different brain parts to interact with each other. And that's actually the case for a lot of the brain. This doesn't mean that reading is only in the parietal lobe. It just means that there's a section of it that seems to be very tightly linked to the process of reading. But most processes require several parts of the brain working together all the time. So we've got taste, we've got speech. There's also some uh, somatosensory. Somato means body. So sensations from the body are processed here. This is, you can poke this and you can make somebody feel like their knee is itchy or all weird things like that. Um, and so on. That's enough for that parietal lobe. If we get to the, uh, what are we left with here? The occipital lobe. back part. As I said before, it's very tied to vision. There's a few sections in there. In fact, it's pretty much the occipital lobe. A lot of it is all basically about vision. Vision is a very important, um, very important uh, sensation for humans and we're very visually oriented so there's a large part of our brain dedicated to it. And then I guess the temporal lobe was last. Temporal lobe. Uh, here we have hearing and smell. Whoops, that says smell. Hearing, smell, um, and some of the things like that. And again, these are just some basic examples. They're not meant to be an actual complete description of everything they do, just to give us some idea. Okay, so there's our brain. And then, of course, the spinal cord extends down from the brain stem through the vertebra. And it's basically a large nerve cable that, with all kinds of little sort of ganglia connections where things can branch off. So that's what all we'll say about the central nervous system. Let's now move on to the peripheral nervous system. And again, we're just trying to get a basic understanding of how it all fits together so that you can 
when you study these things in more detail in your psychology or biology classes, you'll, you'll have, you know, some basic starting point. So the PNS. So you'll remember the peripheral nervous system is composed primarily of afferent and efferent neurons, outgoing and ingoing. Uh, well, we're going to talk about the efferent system primarily. The incoming, the incoming signals are basically just return signals. So the efferent, the efferent system is basically what's going out to the muscles and glands. And so it's got two major divisions. The first major division is what we call the somatic nervous system and the autonomic <clears throat> oops I think I spelled that right uh, I think I spelled it kind of at a, a British version there let's go let's go with just an O there autonomic nervous system sorry about that autonomic nervous system the main distinction is, is that this one is under conscious control. These are things that we can decide to do, like move my hand. Yep, two major divisions. This one is more subconscious control, which means it's sort of automatic. You can think of autonomic as kind of meaning automatic, but don't write automatic nervous system. It's autonomic. If you're autonomous, it means you act on your own. You're autonomous. You're not relying on anyone else. So the autonomic nervous system doesn't rely on you to think about it. It just does stuff. So subconscious control. So this would be things like, you know, adjusting your heart rate or your rate of breathing. Um, many of the different emotional states that we feel would be controlled here. Um, Things that are happening down in your body, like, you know, constriction of blood vessels or dilation of blood vessels. All those things that happen without you thinking about them would be controlled by this. So that's the first major division. Okay? Now we can divide the autonomic system into a further division. We can divide it into what's called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So basically, the efferent system turns into this and this as a flow chart. And then this is going to turn into another box over here and a box down here. And this would be called the sympathetic nervous system. And this is called the parasympathetic. you're both under autonomic control. Yeah. I'm going to deal with this one. Okay, so what do these two things do? Well, the sympathetic and parasympathetic are autonomic nervous systems that basically turn on and off things um, that are in response to major stresses, the fight or flight reaction, things like that. So the sympathetic nervous system, it does things like dilates your pupil. The reason your pupil would dilate is to let in more light. When you're stressed, you want to see what's going on, your your dilated pupils, right? Um, it stimulates the secretion of things. It, 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 um, sorry, no, it inhibits secretion. It, it increases heart rate. Let's, let's just pick some of the, your book has a whole bunch of them, but increases heart rate. Just some of the things to get the idea. You can look on page 539 in your textbook if you wanted to get the full list, okay? Uh, increasing heart rate. Uh, it dilates the bronchioles in your lungs so it, it can, uh, you know, it, it, it increases the efficiency of breathing. Um, it inhibits your stomach. If you're fighting lions, you don't have to worry about digesting your food right now, you know? You don't have to waste energy on that. It... Um, Stimulates glucose release. Let's get some energy. Let's, let's get the glucose blood levels up because we're going to be fighting or flighting, right? Uh, it relaxes your bladder. 
Sometimes when we get a little bit jittery, we feel like we suddenly have to pee. That's probably a holdover from uh, uh, an earlier evolutionary advantage. Many animals will urinate under stress because if you're being eaten by something, a sudden spray of urine might make you slightly distasteful. And so you will often find if you pick up little lizards and animals and things, they sometimes will maybe not urine, they might secrete other things like glands from their skin, uh, toads and frogs, whatever. But peeing on things is actually a good way to evade a predator. And humans still have this in our biology, even though we don't have a whole lot of predators. We still have this weird sensation where in extreme stress, our bladder gives way. Right? Uh, let me go, what else here? Here's an interesting one. It inhibits... Sexual arousal. If you're running from a saber-toothed tiger and you happen to see an, another cute australopithecine, which is a human ancestor, you don't have time to worry about, hey, hey, we should be getting it on because you know what? There's a saber-toothed tiger. So it's pretty hard to get aroused sexually when you're under severe stress. And in fact, with humans, a, a, a big thing that people suffer from are problems in the bedroom, erectile dysfunction, right? Things like that, or the inability to, to uh, engage in sex as, uh, I guess, as, as much as you possibly could. And of course, stress is commonly related to that. Stresses you are under, mind games that your brain can play and can cause your, your, your sympathetic nervous system to kick in, making you feel like you're stressed when you're not. So basically, this is the um, this is the fight or flight reaction. It's turning it on. I'm going to put fight or flight. Getting the body ready and doing all the things that need to be done to prepare you for some kind of stress response. All right? The sympathetic nervous system. It is here to pump you up. That's what it does. The parasympathetic nervous system then has the opposite job. Its job is to say, once the stress is passed, we need to put things back in order. We need to do the opposite. So we need to uh, constrict the pupils back to normal, or you know, don't worry about that. We need to lower the heart rate, or decrease heart rate, back to normal. Right? Not so much decrease it from normal to the point where it's too low, but it's bringing it back from this, this stressed out state. Um, get, go back to stimulating the stomach, for instance. Now that we're out of the stress, let's go back to the stomach doing its job. Right? Glucose release? Nope, we don't really need so much glucose anymore, so we can inhibit glucose release in the liver. We can tell the liver, don't worry about digesting all those starches and glycogens and things. We don't really need them. Uh, stimulates bladder. So actually, you know what? I, I kind of misspoke on that. I was talking about the bladder and the peeing. Relaxing the bladder doesn't make you pee. It actually makes you not pee. It's, con it's uh, constricting the bladder that makes you pee. Now, what you'll often find is the moment you're running from the saber-toothed tiger, you don't have time to worry about peeing. So you just run, and the bladder is relaxed. But the minute that you're suddenly out of stress, that's when you might suddenly feel the massive urge to pee. And then, you know, possibly, you know, people might might uh, urinate under extreme stress situations, sort of, the, as the parasympathetic is trying to calm them back down. So I should correct myself on that. And of course, it, uh, it basically uh, stimulates sexual arousal. Now, that doesn't mean that it makes you sexually aroused. It essentially um, prevents the inhibition, right? Remember, you've got the excitatory neurons and the inhibitory neurons. So um, it basically puts you back to normal. So that's what I'm going to write here. I'm going to write the back to normal system. 
That's essentially what it's doing. Back to that homeostasis, right? You can see this is actually a homeostatic mechanism, which is why it's included in this unit on homeostasis. The, the, the nervous system plays a huge role in maintaining balance. Um, you can see these two systems fighting back and forth, um, allowing yourself to go out of balance temporarily when you need to fight or flight, but then restoring that balance quite right away. Uh, a lot of our stress responses that are unwarranted in our human society, we get stressed. We're put into the fight or flight mode for all kinds of things. Pressures at work, pressures with the family, uh, a, a severe illness, somebody, you know, all kinds of things. And sometimes, sometimes it's, it's not even for something that's stressful. Some people get so caught up that they're stressed about things that shouldn't be stressful, like a hangnail. You know what I mean? And so they obviously need to undergo a therapy, um, some kind of behavior modification or some kind of therapy to help them understand, you know, the stress response and how it should work. Ah, sorry. And uh, again, the parasympathetic system is the one that's bringing everything back after that's done. Yep. So the body adapts. Okay, so, so by adapting, what you mean is, would the body adapt to a, a sympathetic state where all these things were excited and turned on and, and all these other things were happening? Um, your body can, I guess we would say, it could tolerate that. It would tolerate that for short periods of time, but it's not designed to be full-time. So what happens when you get into a state of stress is, yes, your body would sort of... Uh, your body would try to adapt, but because it's not set up that way, uh, one of the things that's, that's secreted is a, uh, a chemical called cortisol associated with stress. Well, if cortisol remains in your high in your bloodstream for long periods of time, it begins to have negative effects on other cells. And so that's the problem. Uh, can you adapt to that? Theoretically, over many, many hundreds of thousands of years, there will be an evolutionary trend. If people are continuously stressed, obviously the mechanism will evolve and those who can't handle it will, will die off, whereas those who can will reproduce. And So there will be an evolution. Yeah, I don't know if there could be so much of... Exactly. Uh, the other thing is, there could also be some adaptation, like some people adapt to being stressed, but it's not necessarily the ideal situation. And we really don't know all the effects of what stress does either. We're just learning this stuff now. We're starting to understand that stress is probably at the root of many of the diseases and, and conditions we suffer from that, you know, we thought before were just things that happen to you. Now we realize, oh, that's because of stress. So once we study this cortisol more and we get more of the understanding of the interactions of all these chemicals being secreted by glands and things, we start to realize that the stress response can be behind a lot of things. Yep. Yep. No, no. The somatic system has nothing to do with stress. The somatic system is your conscious control. That's you saying, oh, I'm going to pick up this cup of tea right now. Look, I'm doing it. Bria, are you watching? I'm going to, I'm going to stop the video because we're pretty much done, and then we can talk about these questions. Uh,